Dear reader, I'm Tony, and this is Book Text. Um, this morning, I finished the final chapter, perfectly titled "A New Beginning," um, to George Gissing, George Gissing's *The Odd Women*, for the Odd Read Along, hosted by Marissa at Blatantly Bookish and Katie at Books and Things. And I have a lot of thoughts and a lot of feelings about this book that I wanted to share with you. But first. Our word of the day um, from the time period that uh, The Odd Woman is set in is a Victorian slang word, giggle mug. Giggle mug. It is a noun. It means a perpetually smiling face. Isn't that cute? Giggle mug. I aspire to have a giggle mug. So I first wanted to talk about um, the glorious cast of characters that we see in The Odd Women um, and how they represent a diverse range of female experiences, uh, particularly in regards to the institution of marriage, which comes up a lot. Um, it was a big part of the Victorian culture, Victorian lifestyle, um, Victorian expectations. And so we get to see how various women um, kind of experience this institution for good or for bad. Um, so spoilers will definitely abound. Beware if you watch this video further and you haven't read The Odd Women yet. So, okay, first we have Alice Madden, who seems somehow to fare the best, at least out of the, the Madden sisters, through the story. She... Um, she struggles with some health towards the beginning, but that seems to clear up. She's able to get um, consistent work. And in the end of the story, she is able to run the school of her dreams, or at least that's where we see her path heading. And what a, what a great ending for her. Um, and of course, she gets to do that with her beloved sister, Virginia, and they both get to raise... Monica's infant daughter together. Then you have Virginia Madden, who becomes an alcoholic to deal with the struggles of spinsterhood and, and the anxiety that that life um, contains for women struggling to find something to occupy themselves with, struggling to pay bills, and so on. Um, and I am so glad that Virginia came to her own and realized that she needed help and asked for that help towards the end of the book. She, she's on a good trajectory, I can tell. Then you have Monica Madden, who becomes Monica Widowson in the book, who marries her husband basically out of convenience, and he turns out to be incredibly jealous and uh, paranoid and he has this uh, strong sense of ownership over his wife and that she has to do what he wants her to do. And he becomes, um, in fact, physically abusive and violent towards her because of his jealousy. Um, and Monica leaves him. And I, as far as I, you know, reading between the lines, they don't get back together at any point. There's some time skips that you don't exactly see what happens, but... They're pretty distant when she at last dies after giving birth to her daughter and her husband has told her that he forgives her of the misunderstanding and of the accusations that he put on her, but they never reconcile. Um, I felt like Monica's story didn't end neatly and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Then we have Rhoda Nunn who is my spirit animal. I want to be Rhoda Nun when I grow up and I don't have that much longer to go before we're the same age. Um, and she made the best choice in the book when she refused to marry or to reconcile with Everard Barfoot. When she rejected him for good, I smiled and giggled to myself. I was so pleased because I could tell that there was something that was not quite good about Everard. He was playing a game with her. He was trying to manipulate her 
Sure, he appreciated her intellect, but he wanted to force her to love him. And that was not cool with me. Um, besides the fact that he had this, this strange past that we weren't quite sure. Um, we, we were only told his side of the story um, and some gossip. And so I'm not quite sure what to think of, of his past. Uh, more on that later. So at the end of the story, uh, Rhoda Nunn definitely had a stronger resolve than Everard thought, and she shot him out, and he ended up marrying somebody else. Um, and I think that uh, her work is to to kind of push forward women's rights to emancipate women from the institution, uh, from the issues of the institution of marriage, um, is flourishing at the end of the book. And I I think that she has learned a lot from her experience falling in and out of love twice. You know, once when she was younger and then um, in the story. And I think she understands other women better because of her experiences, which will only help her cause, will only help her work. I want a million sequels about Rhoda Nunn. Then we have Rhoda Nunn's best friend and business partner, Mary Barfoot who also experiences flourishing work at the end of the, well, toward throughout the story, but especially towards the end. She gave the best speech about women's rights in this book um, in chapter 13, and it was made even greater knowing that she addressed it to Rhoda after a falling out, and she wanted to um, explain herself and show that she does still feel the same way about their shared ideals. Um, so I, I love uh, Mary. Though she was fairly static throughout the story, we do get an interesting glimpse into her heart when we learn that she loves Everard um, but will never act on it. I thought that was really interesting uh, uh, about her and I also want a sequel with Mary Barfoot. Then we have uh, some minor characters. So Mrs. Micklethwaite, who we don't know, we don't see her very much, but she um, marries the man that she loved for 17 or so years um, of waiting. And her health and happiness clearly improve after she gets married, which seems to be the opposite of what happens to a lot of the women in the book. Um, we also briefly see uh, the happiness of the blind sister who is able to live with her as a spinster. Um, they're both being taken care of by uh, the funds from Mr. Micklethwaite. So that was that was a good um, representation of someone who found success and joy in the institution of marriage. Then we have uh, various small characters like Miss Vesper, Mildred Vesper, and uh, Winifred Haven, who were both spinsters who found great joy in working and they they had some they were hardworking they found um, liberation in being able to work oh one one character that I thought was really interesting we don't see too much of her but I'd love to know more is Mrs. Luke Whittison who later becomes Lady Horrocks after she gets married um, she is the sprightly widow is that how she described of uh, Mr. Whittison's brother and she is a wise and powerful socialite um, who offers great advice to Mr. Widowson when he needs it. Um, and she, when she remarries, you know, I just felt like her story represented to me another person who found much success in being married. Um, and it was interesting that she was at the opposite end of the not opposite, but she was farther away on the uh, financial spectrum from Mrs. Micklethwaite, who was quite poor. And then you have um, Mrs. Well, Lady Horrocks, who is quite rich. Um, we also have Miss Ede. I was not expecting Miss Ede to show up later in the book when she approaches Monica in town. Um, she was the jealous shop girl who was always asking Monica about uh, a man that she saw with Monica and Miss Ede really was holding a, a torch for him. She becomes a prostitute and um, she still is asking Monica about that man. And I, her story 
is told as a tragedy. It could have really easily, you know, in, in Victorian literature, the fallen woman or the prostitute often become uh, kind of vilified or they are represented as, uh, you know, this is what not to do, don't follow their example. And this time it was told quite sympathetically. Her story was more um, about uh, a woman, you know, a person who found a tragic path instead of a warning to, to young women reading the book. So I thought that was an interesting way. And I happen to uh, know, as far as I understand, George Gissing himself uh, loved a prostitute and rescued her, whatever that means. Um, so he might have put a little bit of her into Miss Ede. We also have a character whom we never meet in the in the book, um, Amy Drake. We only hear about her through gossip and speculation and accusation as people are talking about what happened in Everard Barfoot's past. We know what well, we were told, which is different from knowing, we are told that she tried to force Everard to marry her, which ironically sounds an awful lot like Everard's plan to force Rhoda to love him. So there's some, some uh, hypocrisy there. Everything we hear about Amy is through someone else's perspective. And I think this is interesting because that's a significant part of women's lives, even today. We're judged and scrutinized and criticized. And the picture that others paint of women is often unfair and inaccurate. And I thought that was interesting to be seen in Amy Drake's story. There's obviously lots of other minor characters. We got Mrs. Cosgrove, Mrs. Conisby, the, the uh, landlady. We got Agnes Brissenden, who is kind of a smart, um, plain woman who uh, Everard ends up marrying. We have Bella Royston, who um, goes to Mary Barfoot and Rhoda Nunn for help, falls out of the way, and then comes back for help and ends up killing herself. And that is what creates a big split between uh, Mary and Rhoda earlier in the story. And also another interesting insight into a woman's life, a woman's experience. So overall, I feel like women's um, experiences and identities are a lot more diverse than just being a wife or a spinster, right? It's not just one or the other. You have in this story, happy wives and unhappy wives. Um, abused wives, beloved wives, rich wives, poor wives, working spinsters, drunken spinsters, spinsters with a cause, prostitutes, victims. You have all this range of, of women's experiences. And I think that's true today. Um, I, I participated in a feminist campaign a few years ago called Embrace Your And. And it was about women's various identities and that we're not just pigeonholed into being a wife or pigeonholed into being um, unmarried or, right, or any of these things. Um, so women can be, you know, I'm proud that I'm a mother and a lawyer or, or whatever their profession was. That there's these various uh, complicated nuances of our lives. So that kind of representing that women are full, rounded, complicated people, um, not just bodies and not just decorations. So I, I really thought that that rang true to me. My favorite moment in the whole book comes when Monica Widowson goes to Rhoda Nunn um, to explain herself, to explain the misunderstanding. And when it's been all cleared up, she express, expresses that she is depressed and fears for her life and maybe even um, expresses some suicidal thoughts. And I could just see Rhoda kind of squaring her shoulders brushing off the dust um, from her kind of feelings, her heart, and giving this counsel to Monica, whom she has only just barely um, forgiven. She says this, Well, I am two and thirty, and I don't call myself old. When you have reached my age, I prophesy you will smile at your despair of ten years ago. At your age, one talks so readily of wrecked life and hopeless future and all that kind of thing. My dear girl, you may live to be one of the most contented and most useful women in England. Your life isn't wrecked at all. Nonsense. You have gone through a storm, that's true. 
but more likely than not, you will be all the better for it. Don't talk or think about sins. Simply make up your mind that you won't be beaten by trials and hardships. There cannot, can there, be the least doubt as to how you ought to live through these coming months. Your duty is perfectly clear. Strengthen yourself in body and mind. You have a mind, which is more than can be said of a great many women. Think bravely and nobly of yourself. Say to yourself, this and that it is in me to do, and I will do it. And then a few lines later, she says, you will be one of the women who are fighting in women's cause. You will prove by your life that we can be responsible human beings, trustworthy, conscious of purpose. I want to give myself that speech when I'm feeling low, when I'm feeling defeated, um, when I'm feeling that I've been through a storm and I need Rhoda Nunn to tell me that uh, I will be better for it. I hope that my life will also prove that women can be responsible human beings. I just love, I loved, loved, loved this book. So tell me, have you read it? Um, what did you think of it? Uh, did you notice anything about women's experiences being represented here? Um, what did you think about how all the different plot lines uh, wrapped up? I think this book, um, and especially that, that kind of speech, demonstrates a great step forward in the portrayal of women in literary history. I'm so glad I read it. And now I need to remind myself and you that there is always another book.